Mm. So the book is about male and female and, you know, arguing for biblical distinctions between male and female, biblical ideas of the proper relationship between men and women in the church and in marriage and so on. And all that I agree with. But what's interesting is that in that book, they appeal to the Trinity to support it. So they say, this is an interesting quote. I, I would like you to really reflect on this statement here. This is from their book, The Grand Design, page 93. The father is the father because he sends the son. The son is the son because he submits to the father's will. And the spirit is the spirit because the father and the son send him. There is no Holy Trinity without order of authority and submission. I think by now you should be able to see that that is a very misleading statement. It is true that the Father sends the Son. It is true that the Son submits to the Father's will. But that's not what makes the Father the Father. That's not what makes the Son the Son. So this basically, logically stated, this statement is just completely false because the personal distinctions between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not rooted in these relations of authority and submission. They are rooted in the eternal procession or uh, eternal begetting relations, the relations of origin that we've talked about throughout this course. So the complementarian hierarchical Trinitarians, they, they're concerned to counter our culture's prejudice against all authority and submission and human relationships, and they want to ground their biblical, those are legitimate biblical concerns, but they want to, they want to ground those concerns in the Trinity itself, in the ontological Trinity. That authority and submission is not simply something that we should do because God has established it in the order of creation, or even because the Son as incarnate submits to the Father, but rather it's something that we should do in our relationships because it's rooted in the very ontological nature of God himself, that the Father is the Father because of his authority in sending the Son, and the Son is the Son because of his role of submitting to the Father. And so that that's taking it to another level that is uh, really inappropriate to do. I want to sever the cord there and say, I agree with all their concerns about, you know, countering the culture and showing that relations of authority and submission can be good and they're not necessarily oppressive and that it's biblical for wives to submit to their husbands in the Lord. And it's biblical for uh, only men to be ordained as pastors and elders in the church. I agree with all of that, but I don't want to root that in the imminent eternal Trinitarian relations, because as soon as you do that, then you end up messing up your doctrine of the Trinity. So it's better just to cut the cord there and say, leave the Trinity out of it and focus on what the Bible teaches about these relationships. And so therefore eternal generation has been added sort of as an empty shell without really fleshing it out. Because if you really fleshed it out the way it ought to be, then you would see that there's no room left for these other relations, at least if you're going to use them as the defining characteristics of the three persons. So that's, that's the best critique that I've read. How can the eternal personal distinctions of the three persons be both relations of origin and relations of authority and submission? How can it be both? Because if the relations of origin, begetting and proceeding, are sufficiently and exhaustively constitutive of the three persons, then we don't have to say anything else. We don't need to go to find, we don't need to search around for other answers to explain uh, what distinguishes the persons. If we say that the relations of origin are not sufficient, and we feel that we do need to add something else, like relations of, or, uh, of authority, then what we're saying is, and I think Grudem doesn't realize this, but he's logically saying that the father's eternal begetting of the son does not of itself constitute the son as son. Right? If, if you don't think that the father's eternal begetting of the son is enough, and that's, that's what defines the son as son, that he's the only begotten son of the father, and thereby that he is, that he possesses the same nature as the father. If you don't feel satisfied with that 
and you feel like you need to find something else like relations of authority, then what you're saying is, is that eternal begetting doesn't really constitute the son as son. <laughs> and so you're in effect denying eternal generation, even though you're claiming that you want to have it on there. The, in, in, in terms of your profession, you're professing that you believe in eternal generation, but in terms of your functional theology, you're actually clinging to eternal relations of authority and submission as your bottom line answer to what makes the son the son and the spirit the spirit. Interestingly, if you don't think that the father's eternal generation of the son is what constitutes the son as son, then you're also going to have to say that the father's relation of being the begetter of the son does not of itself constitute the father as father. And of course, that was one of the arguments that Athanasius made, is that if you deny the eternal sonship of Christ, then you're also denying the eternal fatherhood of the father. Remember that quote where he says that the blasphemy against the son recoils against the father. So in the end, Gruden would either have to say, A, that the relations of authority are what truly and finally constitute the Trinity, or that the relations of origin are just so mysterious to us that we don't really know what they are, and so it's best if we just understand them in terms of relations of authority.